afternoon to everyone present here. I'm Kushi Shivachandra, first year master's in hospital administration, student at Prasanna School of Public Health, Mahe, Manipal, <coughs> India. It is my honor to welcome all the participants from 30 different countries to benefit from the sixth webinar organized by the Manipal Health Literacy Unit, known as MHLU, in collaboration with the Asian Health Literacy Association, known as ALA. MHLU aims to excel in health literacy resources, policies, and practices. The ILA seeks to understand health level across Asia from research, educational, and policymakers' perspective. Collectively, MHLU and ILA are initiating a webinar series on the health literacy for healthcare providers, researchers, policymakers, industry, academia, and the public. Before I invite the first speaker of today's webinar, I have some important requests to the participants. A small request to the distinguished participants to kindly mute their cell phones and the mic. You must post any query or questions during the session through the chat box. We will be addressing a few selected questions considering the time limit. In today's webinar, we will be hearing insights from expert on adapting and localizing health literacy instruments and health literacy tools from development to application. Please note the speaker will be sharing the insights for 15 minutes. It is my pleasure to introduce our first esteemed speaker of today's webinar, Dr. Mark Carmen Cornelia Talloving. Dr. Mark Carmen Cornelia Talloving is a public health professional specializing in epidemiology. She is a professor at the University of Philippines in Manila, teaching epidemiology, biostatistics, and research. She holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in public health, PBPH, sorry, PSP, PBPH, MPH, and doctorate in PH, with a specialization in epidemiology from the University of Philippines. Her research interest includes health information system health human resource, program evaluation, and health literacy. Dr. Carmen is known for her work in health literacy, including the development and validation of functional health literacy instructions. She serves as a consultant for the Philippines Council for Health Research and Development, PCHRD, and is a member of National Research Council and National Ethics Committee in the Philippines. Additionally, she is the Deputy Director of the Asia Health Literacy Association Country Office in Philippines. Her recent publication, ranging from associations between health literacy and socioeconomic factors to the intersection of digital health literacy and mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic, underscore her commitment for advancing public health knowledge and practices. Dr. Carmen Talubing's multifaceted contributions continue to make a lasting impact on the field of public health in the Philippines and beyond. Now, I would like to request Dr. Mark Carmen Cornelia Talobing to share her insights on today's topic. Over to you, ma'am. Can you hear me? Thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, Sporty. Um, can you please share my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. In a second. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and advocates for improved health literacy, good afternoon. Special greetings to the Manipal Health Literacy Unit, the Manipal Academy of Higher Education, and the Asian Health Literacy Association for co-organizing this very important webinar series. Thank you for having me this afternoon to talk about adaptation and localization of health literacy instruments. Ma'am, is it visible? Yes, it's visible. I can see it. Can you move on to the next second slide, please? Yes. I cannot see it now. Okay, there. All right, so health literacy has been recognized as an important determinant of healthcare outcomes. It is often described as having two 
interrelated sides and is likened to a coin with two sides. One side of the health literacy coin represents the individual and the other side the healthcare system. Just as a coin loses its value without both sides, health literacy is dependent on the interplay of these two facets. Next slide, please. The individual health literacy side focuses on the knowledge and skills of individuals to access, understand, appraise, and apply health information, as well as to navigate the entire gamut of healthcare services effectively from promotive care to curative care services. Next, please. Now, the other side is the healthcare system, and healthcare system health literacy focuses on the responsibility of the healthcare system to communicate health information clearly and to provide services that are accessible and understandable to individuals. Next, please. Next. The interaction between these two facets of health literacy is crucial in improving healthcare outcomes. The significance of efforts to enhance health literacy is going to be compromised if we overlook either aspect. Thus, our efforts, our journey to Health literacy, improved health literacy necessitates interventions on both sides. Next, please. Okay, in our evolving, um, ever evolving healthcare landscape, the ability to assess health literacy is of paramount importance to interventions. Now, in this process diagram, you will observe that for interventions to achieve effectiveness, they must be appropriate in terms of both content and their target audience. An intervention should address the identified needs and gaps in knowledge, as well as needs and gaps in health literacy skills. But where do these needs and gaps originate? They arise as outcomes of the measurement process. Evaluating the level of health literacy is pivotal to ensure that interventions are finely tailored to a specific context. Now, this process, as you can see, is inherently iterative because following the implementation of the intervention, further measurements are taken to gauge its effectiveness. We must discard interventions that prove ineffective while expand those that demonstrate success, thereby perpetuating this cycle of improvement. Next slide, please. Next, in making measurements, our goal should be to utilize instruments that will generate information with unparalleled accuracies. So it is imperative to select a suitable instrument that is both appropriate for the population and that will exhibit desirable qualities, primarily validity and reliability. These qualities are often referred to as the psychometric properties of an instrument as they determine the instrument's capacity to gather precise and dependable data. Next, please. Now, there are a total of 162 validated instruments to measure population health literacy. These are validated and according to Tavusi et, and uh, colleagues in their paper published in 2022, this 162 is just a subset of the available instruments for population health literacy measurement in the literature. Only 162 as of uh, 2021 have been validated. Conversely, there's only three instruments have been reported in the literature to measure health provided health literacy. This is the instrument on health literacy competencies for Chinese speaking health professions. Maybe between 2021 and at present, there have been additional instruments that have been developed, but uh, based on my uh, latest review, I, there are only three. And lastly, I found one single instrument designed specifically for accessing 
healthcare organization, health literacy known as the org H. Next, please. When um, considering health literacy assessment, we have two available options for uh, deciding on which instrument to use or what instrument to use. Either we develop a new instrument or we adapt an existing one. Whichever option we choose, the process should strictly adhere to technical standards so that research data are um, will generate so that research data, data that are generated are accurate and reliable. Next, please. Let's now delve into the topic of adapting health literacy instruments. However, before we do so, let's try to distinguish between the concept of adapting with a letter A and adopting an instrument. Now, adapting with a letter O, an instrument is typically considered, can you move up? Can you scroll up? Okay, thank you. Is typically considered when minimal modifications are made to the instrument. Um, scroll up, please, Porthy. Porthy. No, next slide, please. Next, next. No, you're going back. Forward, please. Down. Next, please, Sporty. Next. 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 There. Next. Adopt and adapt. That that slide down. Okay. So um, sorry about that. No, the previous slide. The one with the two columns. That one. Please keep it there. Uh, sporty. Thank you. So adapting uh, the one with uh, letter O. An instrument is typically considered when there's minimal modification made to the instrument, and both its structure and content remain largely preserved. Specifically, purely translating an instrument into a local language is generally regarded as a form of adopting the instrument rather than adapting it. Conversely, when substantial modifications are made to the instrument, it is categorized as instrument adaptation. This time, there is an alteration of the content or structure or both to fit the new context, culture, or the population to which the instrument will be administered. So adapting an instrument goes beyond translation and can involve revisions in the wording, the response format, the response options, and cultural considerations. Next, please. Okay, adapting an instrument involves a process, a systematic process to ensure that the instrument is appropriate for the target population and have good psychometric properties. Here are the steps involved in the process of adaptation. First is modification of the instrument, followed by translation into the local language if needed. Cognitive testing of the initial version of the adapted instrument then follows. Now, the revised version is then um, pre-tested and based on the result of the pre-testing, further revisions are made. And finally, the revised version will undergo validity and reliability assessment. Then the instrument will be ready for administration to the target population. Okay, let me talk a little bit more about each step of the process. So in the adapting of the instrument uh, where we make some modifications, we first have to review existing instruments and find out which ones are uh, culturally appropriate. And if modifications have to be done, then this is the step we do the changes. Now, after making the necessary changes, we now have the initial version of the adapted instrument. Next, please. 
the diagram shows the uh, translation process. It begins with forward translation where the original English content is translated into a local language and in this diagram and using the Philippine language. The translation is carried out by skilled language professionals. And in the Philippines, we tapped the agency of government, the Commission on Philippine Languages, to do the forward translation for us. Subsequently, the translated version undergoes a back translation into English, and this uh, has to be conducted by a separate group of language experts who are proficient in both the local language and the English language. Now, to assess the quality of the translation, a rigorous analysis is performed comparing the English translated version with the original English version. Now, there is an evaluation framework devised by Paul et al., which um, we actually used in the translation of the instrument that we utilized for the first nationwide software survey. Next slide, please. We refer to this as the translation analysis. Uh, the framework proposed by uh, Hall et al. involves comparing the back translated English version with the original English version and then um, assessing the similarity and rating the items on a scale of A, B, C, and D. The translated English version will receive an A rating if it demonstrates perfect semantic equivalence along with a strong literal and equivalent as, along with strong literal and semantic parallelism a b rating is assigned if there is satisfactory semantic equivalence but one or two different words are present a c rating is given when the original meaning is preserved but there is no satisfactory equivalence and finally a D rating is reserved for cases where there is no equivalence at all or no agreement between the original version, English version, and the version, the back translated version. Um, and items rated as either A, B, or C are retained, while those rated as D has to undergo the translation process once again. Next slide, please. In the assessment, uh, that we have done in the Philippines where I was involved in, there were two occasions wherein we adopted a health literacy instrument. These are the HLS EUQ47 Asia version and the short version of it, the HLS SF12 version. Um, we also adapted with the letter A two instruments. The first is the NVS for measuring population of, of, sorry, functional health literacy of Filipinos. And our modifications included change in the case scenario, change in the wording of the questions, and change in the number of items from six to five. And the other instrument that we adapted um, was the IOHLS for measuring population of health provider health literacy rather. And our modifications involved change in wording of the questions and reduction in number of items from 49 to 25 items. Please. After the translation, cognitive testing is done to test the initial version of the adapted instrument. Now, during this phase of the um, adaptation process, a small group of individuals from the target population is asked to complete the instrument. The purpose is to identify any potential issues with the item wording, um, formatting, or comprehension. And based on the outcomes of the cognitive testing, adjustments are made leading to the refinement of the initial version, which is now referred to as the revised version of the instrument. After cognitive testing, pre-testing, next please, uh, Sporty, next please, pre-testing. So after cognitive testing, pre-testing of the revised version is done to ensure that all kinds of errors are minimized. Now, please note that there is no such thing as error-free measurement, but we can minimize these errors if we adhere to technical standards in developing and in adapting instruments. The output of the cognitive testing is referred to as the final version. 
Now there's a, a set of general guidelines and this uh, they suggest, you know, the author suggests involving 12 to 50 participants in the pre-testing phase. Uh, according to the authors, exceeding this range, particularly surpassing 50 participants, often results in diminishing returns, uh, which means that the associated costs and time investment in interviewing more than 50 participants outweigh the potential benefits. Next slide, please. The final phase of the adaptation process involves evaluating the validity and reliability of the instrument. There are various types of validation that are considered, including the simplest is phase validity and is also considered the crudest form. So the usual uh, validation that is done include content validity, construct validity, and criterion validity. On the reliability aspect of the instrument assessment and compasses, um, internal consistency, test retest reliability, and interrater reliability. Now, allow me, that's I think my last slide, allow me to conclude by reaffirming the earlier statement I made that the precise assessment of both the health literacy of the population and the health literacy system is absolutely crucial. This accuracy is paramount in guiding policy decisions and interventions aimed at enhancing health literacy within the community. We have to remember that the data collection instrument represents a significant contributor to measurement errors. So by strictly adhering to the process of instrument development and adaptation, we can mitigate these errors and ensure that our assessments are robust and dependable. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sporthy. Thank you so much for your enlightening talk, ma'am. So let me introduce our second speaker of today's webinar, Dr. Joshma P. Disoza. Dr. Dr. Joshma Disoza is a public health researcher currently affiliated with the International Agency for Research on Cancer, part of the World Health Organization based in Lyon, France. She is an alumna of the Prasanna School of Public Health, Manipal, and holds a PhD in public health from the University Catholic de Loué in Belgium. Dr. Disoza's research primarily focuses on psychosocial determinants or cervical cancer screening uptakes. She specializes in implementation research and translational research aimed in promoting screening. Her journey into health literacy research began in 2016, and she has been an active member of the Asian Health Literacy Association and IHLA since then. Her work uniquely incorporates health behavior theories to understand psychosocial barriers with a special focus on the role of health literacy in screening uptakes. Her research, her research on application on theoretical models has led to the development of pioneering models and tools for assessing screening barriers. The Indian version of health literacy measuring tools developed by Dr. Souza and her teammate is available in two languages, which is now used by several researchers across India for assessing individual health literacy levels. Currently, a postdoctoral researcher in IARC is collaborated with a world-class expert on international projects, contributing by designing a development tool for cancer-related implementation research. Now, I would like to request Dr. Joshma P. Souza to share her insights on today's topic. Over to you, ma'am. Um, are my slides visible? Oh, yes. Um, hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, as, as rightly said or rightly known, health literacy is widely recognized as a critical factor influencing health outcomes. Given the array of health literacy tools available, each serves a specific purpose. Now, if a tool is developed, there are certain considerations. 
Now, this information is invaluable for researchers, helping them make informed decisions about the application of existing tools or the development of new ones. So my name is Joshma D'Souza. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Early Detection Prevention and Infections Branch of the International Agency for Research in Cancer World Health Organization. Big thanks to Manipal Academy of Higher Education and the Asian Health Literacy Association for giving me this opportunity. I'd like to note that the information I'll be sharing today in this forum reflects my own knowledge and expertise in the field and does not respect the does not represent the views of my employer or the organization. So the aim of this presentation is to provide an overview on the tool development and inform its application. I'm sure most uh, most of the topic, most of the um, most of the top most of the topics under this development of the tool is covered by Professor Carmen because she spoke she spoke uh, specifically about how to adapt the existing tools. So I will provide an overview of what goes to develop a tools from a tool from scratch. So because sometimes you might want to develop a new tool uh, based on the existing domains so or the existing tools. There are several definitions of health literacy. In simple terms, it is the ability or capacity of an individual to obtain, process, and understand health information and to use it as in to make appropriate health decisions. Now, these definitions talk about health information, and health information can come from various sources or contexts, and it can be of various types. The National Center for Education Statistics identified three types of literacy. It can be cross-literacy, which is the ability to assess and gather information on continuous data, let's say health education materials, document literacy, which is the ability to extract data from tables or figures, let's say an example of a lab report, or quantitative literacy, which shows the ability of an individual to assess, let's say, food labels and understand the calories in the food that the individual is consuming. So here's a peek at few tools and their characteristics. Well, I will not go and explain in detail about how they work. However, if you see the pattern here, the idea is that they provide some sort of terms or passages and check if the individual is able to recognize the health related terms. So clearly you're testing some sort of comprehension, orientation to the health instruction material they individual has. There are other tools that we know, health literacy questionnaire, the European health literacy tools that are based on participant information. So here we ask the individual if they are able to perform certain tasks, be it seeking information, understanding a document, or be it numerical skills. So these are some sort of subjective measures. So they are, of course, available on the platform and the details are provided here for your reference. So like we said, although all claim to measure health literacy, they can focus on a specific type of literacy or applicable to specific contexts, which is usually listed by the developers. So you see, you can choose from the array of tools that suits your scenario or research, as rightly said by Professor Carmen. See that the purpose of Realm is specified by its creators. So to answer the question, various factors influence selection of the tools. So it could be a purpose of research. Are you trying to assess individuals' ability to understand medical instructions, or are you evaluating the effectiveness of health education materials? It also depends on your target population. Some tools might be better suited for older adults, while some might be designed for a population with lower educational background. Type of literacy that you're trying to assess, like we discussed earlier, whether you want to assess prose literacy, document literacy, or the numeracy. Practicality also matters. How much time do you have to assess the health literacy of the individual? Do you want validated tools? Is the tool applicable to the context of your study, as in the language and cultural relevance? Cost and accessibility to the tools based on the resources you have? And what does the literature recommend about the tools? Which one do you want to use? It depends on various factors. So what goes in tool development? Tool development is a vast and a very complex topic, but we will discuss in brief here 
So since I'm discussing uh, in detail, uh, uh, discussing in brief about the, the tool development from scratch, so there could be some concepts uh, that can overlap with the concepts covered by Professor Carmen, and I will try to skip those. So the first step to tools development is to articulate the domains that you're endeavoring to measure. A domain or construct refers to the concept that is the target of your study. Therefore, the domain being examined should be decided upon. Now, these domains are often constructed by conclusions from literature reviews, theoretical concepts that explain the phenomenon of interest. It could be anything. A simple example can be these domains of the European Health Literacy Questionnaire. So identification of domains is followed by proper conceptualization and definition of the domains. Now, this is very important at the stage because this can result in scales that can either be deficient because if you do not define a domain well, it can lead to ambiguity. And this can also result in contamination of the items in the item development phase, which we are trying to dis which we will discuss in the next step. So going next is the item generation phase, which I just mentioned. So this is a process of question development. So you have already have the domains now, and right now you're trying to identify or formulate questions for the domains. Now, this is a critical step in constructing a reliable and a valid instrument. Now, there are two ways of doing it. One way is based on the description of your domain, based on the conceptualization of your domain. Uh, you identify the items through literature review and extract the items from existing scales for that domain. So we refer to this as the deductive method, or another way is conducting exploratory research. So you get you do have direct observations, you can do qualitative research, conduct individual interviews, and you inductively identify these items. So this is more of an inductive approach. So it's recommended to use both in such a scenario of tool development. So some essential points to remember is to ensure the quality of the questions or the items that you have generated to make sure that the items are clear, consistently understood, and they should be able to be consistently administered as well. So one must ensure that the respondents have access to the information needed to answer the questions accurately, and also that they are willing to provide such kind of information without any, without any problem. About the type of items, now the, the items can be either dichotomous or it could be uh, answered on a Likert scale. Now again, in the Likert scale, it can be a five response item, it could be a seven response item. Now that depends on against the type of the, uh, the type of the question, if it's a unipolar or bipolar. And about the number of items in the tool, it's always recommended that the initial pool of items that you are developing is always twice as long as the actual tool that you might have to do, you might have to come up with later. So these are some points to consider. So yeah, so like I said, the idea is to have the items that are broad and more comprehensive in the item generation phase. So sometimes the items that you have generated can be divergent or unrelated to the core constructs. So so as to be, so you want more items while develop while generating the items so that you're able to evaluate and eliminate these items or the undesirable items later in the other phases. So next phase like here mentioned is the content validation. The aim is to make sure that the items that you have generated sufficiently cover the domains that are intended to cover. Now this process often involves a combination of theoretical foundation, expert consultation and frequent testing. Now because it requires content relevance, representativeness, and technical quality. We use several methods to ensure this. The most important is to ensure technical quality by the evaluation by experts, and also ensure that we get enough feedback from the target population. So we have it validated by both, uh, both the teams. The expert team that confirms the content is clear and sticks to the construct, and the evaluation team, that is your target audience, that ensures that your items are clear. Now, the next step is the pre-testing. So this, I think this is covered by Professor Carmen. So I will not go in detail about this step.
Yeah, so the pre so the two in the pre-testing phase, what we are trying to understand is to make sure that we 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 don't have items that are not understood by individuals. So, for example, if we have ambiguous items or uh, items that are not uh, understood by individuals, so you can take about five to fifteen interviews uh, into two or three rounds, or until saturation, or relatively until you get few insights from individuals. And um, that way you can try and understand how are the items perceived by, by the individuals. The survey administration is, is the next step. Now in the survey administration, again, you can, you can conduct this online or by in-person or, uh, or uh, both of these uh, methods have their own drawbacks pros and cons, while online administration helps you to collect a large amount of data in a short period of time, might reduce the errors, data input errors, but at the same time, the person in-person administration can help you see the non-verbal responses of the individuals. So number of responses required for this survey depends on uh, various factors. However, the recommended is they say at least you have more than 300 samples while you're testing this. Um, there is a lot of debate around the number of responses for survey administration. Um, there are studies that suggest that it's better you have more than 500, 450 to 500. And uh, basically the idea is to have more samples or the more responses in this, in this phase to make sure that the items um, generated are more generalizable to the context of your study. So item reduction is a phase where uh, you want to remove the unnecessary items. So as the word says, uh, to ensure that only the necessary ones are, are retained. So typically researcher uses some kind of uh, classical test theory or, or more like the item response kind of a theory. Now it can be used individually or in combination. The ultimately, the main objective is to secure items that are functional. So the difficult items can be either eliminated or rephrased. So the factor extraction is the next step in the tool development process. Now, factor analysis is like a tool we use to understand the hidden pattern behind the items or the questionnaire you've generated. The emphasis is on the number of factors or components that can significantly explain the variance in the data set. Now, I don't want to make it very complex. Let's see the scree plot here. Now, for the scale development, a common method to determine the number of factors is to see a scree plot. A scree plot is a graphical representation used in factor analysis or the principal component analysis. It helps you to determine how many factors or components can be retained in your model. Now, it's a plot of the eigenvalues against the number of factors or the components in descending order. So you see on the x-axis, you see the number of factors or the components, and the y-axis, it represents the eigenvalues. Now, the eigenvalues indicate the amount of variance explained by each factor. So what we do here is, is we usually look for the elbow in the plot, and the point where the slope of the curve changes and starts to flatten is known as the elbow. So you see here on the top, there is one factor about the elbow. So often researchers retain the factors with eigenvalues greater than one, as these factors explain a substantial amount of variance. So this is known as the Kaiser's criterion. So scree plot helps you to visually determine the number of factors that you can extract from, from the pool of your items. The last but not the least is the scale evaluation phase. So now that you've extracted the factors from your item, from your pool of items, uh, it's only a hypothetical structure that you've extracted. The dimensionality of these factors need to be tested. So before moving to reliability and validity, the dimensionality and the psychometrics need to go on. So test of dimensionality needs to be conducted in a certain fashion. Now for this, we do a confirmatory factor analysis. Now, Confirmatory factor analysis is a statistical technique used to verify the factor structure that you might have identified in the previous step. Now, for your items, the confirmatory factor analysis allows you to test the hypothesis 
that the domains or the factors that are extracted explain the variables that are in your tool. If you see this diagram here, Q1, Q2, Q3 to Q33 are the items or the questions in the tool. So we call this as observed variables. The L1, L2, L3 and L4 are the domains to this questionnaire that we validated recently. Now, one thing to preliminary assess here is the factor loadings. Now, every item loads to its latent variable. If you see, there's an arrow that comes from the latent variable to the questionnaires, to the questions. Now, we check to see if these loadings are above a certain limit to see if the factor loadings are sufficient, usually greater than 0.7. Now, we draw double-sided arrows between the latent variables to denote the covariance because usually these items within the tool are correlated. We also check some model fit statistics to confirm that the model fit is good. Now, this is a complex process and you can always um, use help from a psychometrist. Now, this phase follows test retest reliability, where you administer the tool to few participants at two different time plots and see if the answers provided at time one are consistent to the answers provided at time two. That's what we call as test and retest reliability. So we test the correlation between the response at time one and then the response at time two. So if you see the coefficient relationship, if it's the correlation coefficient is close to one, it denotes the item as reliable. So this was a general overview of the tool development and the steps involved and how to go about. Now, as you see, this is a very complex process, but however, tool validation is often used in research, be it you are using a already existing tool and adapting or adapt, adopting it, like Professor Carmen said, or if you want to design and develop a tool from scratch. So if this if that's the case, these are the processes that you might have to go through. And of course, you need to ensure that the instrument that you're developing is accurate, reliable, and effective in measuring the constructs they are designed to assess. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing valuable insights on the topic. Now I would like to invite Dr. Roshan Kumar Mahato who is working in Faculty of Public Health, Konkin University, Konkin Thailand, and Assistant Professor will be a moderate for today's panelist discussion. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Shofi, and the uh, Manipal Academic of Health Science. Uh, <coughs> uh, health and education for, uh, I'd like having me for this uh, panel discussion, moderator for this panel discussion on the sixth uh, health uh, literacy webinar, and uh, we have a very, uh, very good and delightful uh, uh, speaker today, the both of them, and very nice to meet you, uh, meet you all. And today we, we do have like more nearly 100 participants. So uh, probably like I would like to request all those participants to write their questions on the chat box. Uh, probably I might not be able to get all the questions, but I will try to uh, make a, a construct it and then uh, uh, like uh, present your questions uh, into the speaker. So. Uh, before I'm getting the questions, I'll just uh, take an opportunity to ask you just the one question first. So start with uh, uh, the both of the speaker, like I would like to ask about uh, what are the main challenges did you face during the validation of the questionnaire? Because uh, it's a very difficult job actually to validate the questionnaire and then you have to go through the uh, population and then you, can, you have to test it and then uh, finally you have to present it and then you can say, okay, now we are ready to use this. Uh, so, can you please a uh, little bit enlighten on this 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 part first? Thank you so much. Maybe start with uh, Dr. Professor Ma and then Dr. Yosna, please. Yeah. Sorry, your mic is muted. OK, one of the challenges is the time needed to complete the process, um, especially if you have a funded research. I think this should be, uh, I think, a point to remember for everyone who is applying for funding for research. You have to include in your budget that particular aspect of instrument development, 
the validation process because usually it takes time. It takes months even because you have to uh, pre-test, pilot test, and uh, validate the instrument in a subset of your target population. So imagine if you're doing, for example, a nationwide survey, you will have to get your participants from uh, the areas where you plan to um, administer the full-scale survey. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Yus, yes, uh, yes, I think uh, Professor Carmen is uh, really correct uh, in that in that term. And to little add to on add to on that is is the the fidelity, the concept of the con the concept of fidelity to the to the baseline concepts, especially when you're adapting the tools. Uh, it, it's it is possible that uh, we we um, in the in in the process of adapting uh, the tools, it is possible that we uh, we fiddle with the internal structure of the domains or the items that that uh, that relate to the domains. And this is this can lead to problems in psychometric. Uh, while doing psychometric analysis, so this is this is I think this is one major factor that I have faced uh, as uh, while doing the psychometric analysis because this is this is one question that usually comes from the researchers as to well I translated the tool just like it was but uh, we don't uh, see a fit uh, to the 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 model uh, that is the 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 confirmatory factor analysis. So what are you trying to do over here? Is you're trying to translate the tool as it is to your context, making sure that you your content sticks to the domains. Now, that is the construct. It should measure what it intends to measure. Now, this is one uh, challenge as a if as a psychometrist, I'm not a I wouldn't say I'm a psychometrist or an expert, but this is what I have faced while doing the psychometric analysis for the tools that we have developed. So, to make it easier, I think it's always better to include the experts who have developed the tools while doing your adaptation or adoption or adaptation to make sure that you are sticking to the core concepts or core domains of, of the tool. So this is what I would like to add. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for yeah, specific uh, specification of that one. Like uh, usually young researchers are very much uh, confused on how and where to start and then what sort of tool they can use and how to start how to do it, the validations and then uh, it is a little bit difficult for them and this, this session I think is quite helpful for them as well. I uh, still I'm not getting uh, any questions again so can I get a chance to ask another question once again. Uh, so I have already like uh, we already know like you have already uh, discussed uh, and developed the tools in Philippines also and India of course you are using that one. So how difficult is uh, uh, like uh, uh, how how different is from the original the tool uh, what we are using from the like the uh, EU 47 SLQ 47 how different is that one and uh, to apply uh, and uh, what sort of things what you get uh, from that one because the domain is nearly the same right yeah so maybe yeah professor Cameron please maybe can you explain it a little bit Okay, so the we adopted with the letter O the yes, 47 okay. item questionnaire. So there were really no significant changes that were made. We simply just translated the instrument because on initial um, discussion, we can we did not need to um, local. We did not need to make a major or sufficient changes, especially because we use the Asia version. And there were already changes made um, to the original European version. So there was not really that much of a problem. Yeah. What about uh, the Hindi? Yeah. Yes, um, thank you for the question. But I think um, um, we, we, we started with the European tool as well. This is not, nothing but the... Am I audible? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. So this is nothing... Uh, as our tool was nothing but a translation or the version of the European Health Literacy tool. We, we first started with the 47 version tool. We translated the 47. We actually translated the 47 right. version tool, but for the research, we wanted to validate the, the shorter version 
because uh, it's more practical for research use than the 47 uh, version tool. Uh, so um, the domains, everything fall in line with the European uh, uh, EU, um, EU tool. But again, like you said, um, it is not a mandate uh, uh, to to you know there is there there are no strict rules and regulations to use a certain tool, so this is what I was trying to explain that um, that a researcher who wants to do a certain uh, research dip, uh, depends on the objective of your research. If it is more uh, if the context is more in a hospital environment and you're trying to understand if the if you're trying to validate a health education material. Uh, in that case, maybe uh, more like uh, uh, like you know the prose literacy and the document literacy can matter. In that matter, see if the individual can understand the health literacy, the, the health related terms. Um, and as far as I understand, we use this tool because we wanted to know a general health literacy uh, among the general population. So, you know, because here this tool uh, is very comprehensive and it covers all the aspects of health, health, uh, um, disease prevention, health promotion. Uh, so also about how to access, understand information, use information. So there are various domains here and they can be used in a general context. And this is the reason why we use this tool. So it doesn't mean that you have to use this tool every time and everywhere. So uh, for us, this was more feasible and was more applicable. So this is why we went with Health Literacy European tool, because we wanted to check the Europe, uh, the health literacy level of individuals in the population in general. We wanted to see general health literacy. And what we did is that with that health literacy data, we tried to analyze to see if it's, if it's related to individuals screening behavior or intention to uh, take cervical cancer screening. Now, these, these papers are av available uh, online. I can provide the link if you want to. But so this yeah. is the idea that we that we worked on. So thank you so much for the in insightful uh, <coughs> thought. So now I have got one question from the Rui. So rather I can just read from the chat box. Rui, can you please explain your question? It's a very appropriate question that you have asked. Rui, are you there? OK. OK, I'm not sure if Rui, your question is about the time uh, interval between the administration yeah. of the pretest right. and the post test is that the one for the yes. reliability if it's for the reliability based on literature it's two weeks so right. that's about the time when you want to test retest if your goal is to assess the reliability of the instrument that's what oh. i know from related literature maybe dr mm. Souza can add to that or maybe you have another perspective on the uh, interval between measurements to assess um, test retest test reliability. Uh, well, the test retest reliability depends on um, the, the one main factor is that the individual uh, um, needs to be administered tool in such a way that uh, he will not actually completely remember what he what the answers he had given earlier. All right, so this should be a new uh, it should be a new tool for him, all, all, all the way a new tool, and he should be able to avoid, uh, give answers from scratch and listen, read the uh, items and give the answers there. So like Dr. Carmen said, I think that would be a, a reasonable time if you consider two weeks, uh, because uh, as long as... Um, uh, uh, as long as the participants are reachable, that could be a challenge. That could be a challenging thing to reach the same participants again at this time interval too. So this is one uh, practical, uh, practical uh, challenge that uh, researchers face. But as long as this is considered, I think this is good. Two weeks should be fine. Yeah, and she has also another question because uh, she's asking for how much will be the sample size is recommended for that. So that maybe this is another challenge for all of us to how to how to measure it. So can you please explain on this this part as well? So maybe the appropriate sample size to test and retest. So, the, yeah. OK, so uh, if I can go ahead, so go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I, I well, like like I said, we depend on the literature. We do we understand what is in the literature and what is best. That is the right. best practices for uh, psychometric analysis or uh, tool development. Um, um, as far as I know, it's not they say it's up to 20, 10 to 20. Uh, or the thing is, the more you do, you'll get 
too many responses. And ultimately, what you're trying to see is not individ compare individual responses with each other, with, with, with the participants, with each other, but within the participant. That is one participant's response at two different intervals. So, so I think um, uh, 20 should be fine. Depends on the tool as well. If the tool it contains too many domains, then you can you can still I think go up to 20. I'm not very sure because because for us we did a percentage of the sample. For example, we 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 had a sample size of around 300 and we took a certain percentage of the sample, like 10% of the sample. And then we we tried to test the retest reliability on the sample. So um I, I would say 10% because this is what I understand from the from the literature. But uh, yes, Professor Carmen, if you want to add on to it, you're, you're free. Yes, thank you. Um, that was actually one of the problems we encountered when we were validating the NBS. That's an instrument that measures prose literacy, document literacy, and numeracy. So when we developed, the, we had to adapt. That means we had to change the uh, material because the NBS uses an ice cream label and we found that was not appropriate in the Philippines. So we used a uh, Department of Health flyer on vaccination. Um, so we had to decide on the sample size and uh, scanning the literature, we just found a rule of thumb that says 10 respondents for every item. That's the ratio. So since we had six items in our instrument, we needed 60 respondents following that rule of thumb. So 60 for, uh, we used, by the way, the criterion validation where we computed for the sensitivity, specificity, uh, percent false positive, percent false negative um, of the uh, instrument that we're using, using the NBS as the gold standard. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. So we are already at the end of this, nearly the end of the session. So I would like to request both of the speaker to just give your final remarks about uh, uh, the, the session, the sixth uh, health literacy webinar. Maybe start with the Professor Carmen first and then your snap, please. Okay, so as I have always said, there is no such thing as an error-free measurement, but as researchers, our goal should be to minimize these errors. And minimizing these errors involve adhering to technical standards in the development and adaptation of health literacy instruments. We need to come up with uh, research data that are useful for policy decisions and for interventions. And therefore, uh, just like a surgeon who uses a precise instrument, to perform operations, delicate operations, we also should come up with health literacy instruments that possess those qualities, valid and reliable. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Yusna, please. Yes, um, to add on to Professor Carmen's uh, comments, um, development of the tool can uh, happen from scratch or it may be adapted or adopt adopted from the existing tools. So if you are developing tools from the scratch, it's very essential to uh, follow the best practices that are given um, to make sure that the uh, the experts who develop the tool are included in the tool uh, validation process to make sure that uh, you uh, stick to the fidelity of the core constructs of the tool. And, uh, um, and of course, uh, the literature gives you a vast array of tools that are available. That is the Health Literacy Toolshed has large number of tools that are available which you can uh, 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 browse and access for your research so good luck if you are conducting research in health literacy thank you so much for very insightful thoughts and comment and then we discussed lots of things together and i think we still have a 88 participant and they are very very fruitful again so on behalf of the organizing team uh, manipal academy of health education and national health literacy association i would like to thank all those participants and both speaker professor Kerman and dr yoshna for and then uh, <coughs> i hope we will meet again for the another same in our webinars of course thank you so much thank you thank you so much thank you everyone thank you thank you everyone thank you so uh, I extend my thank you, everyone. Yeah, I over to yeah. Thank you all.
Bye. Thank Bye. You. Yeah, thank you.